So we're on to part three, discussing being a citizen of heaven. And uh, our key scripture is out of Philippians 3.20, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we've been talking about what it means to be a citizen of heaven, but the key scripture says that we're eagerly awaiting a Savior from there. So what does that look like? You know, if you read the, the book of the Revelation, you realize that there's a lot of things that go on in there. Are you eagerly looking forward to that? Yes, Lord. Well, it's, that's, that's what he's saying. Because if that's what it takes to bring the Lord, we'd, we understand that we don't want to end up fighting the plan of God. We know that, that Peter struggled against that. He said, no, Lord, this crucifixion thing is just a really bad idea. So we're, I'm gonna, we need to stop this. Well, obviously it wasn't a bad idea. It was the perfect plan. So we believe that the Lord has a perfect plan for these days. And that we're to eagerly await what's coming because it's his way and the best way to do what he's going to do. So we say, Lord, why don't you come down here and fix this mess? And what's his answer? I will. I'm coming. He's going to do exactly that. And he's got a plan for that. But when he comes, will he find faith on the earth? Will he find a people ready for his kingdom? We talked about the fact that when he shows up, he's going to have to set up a government really quick because the world's going to be in a really bad situation. So where do you think he's going to get the government to be able to run the world? Who do you think he's going to use as the government? Us. But you think it's going to be run the way the world runs the government? No, it's going to be run in the kingdom way. So we are in kingdom school right now. Don't wait for when he returns and try to sign up for a seven-year kingdom college, you're in it. So it's important to understand the kingdom. The message tonight in part three is who is the greatest? And as you see, I've got some of the time covers here from the person of the year. I think it used to be man of the year, but they've opened it up a little. So you see, I've got from people from politics, uh, from religion, from business, and um, even some uh, people from the I guess you'd say it's uh, human rights. And then I've got this little picture down here in the corner of a little guy who's uh, washing feet. So let's talk about that. What do you, so the question is, who is the greatest here? And let him who is the greatest among you become as the servant, Luke 22, 27. You see, the kingdom does not work the same way as the world. And that's what we're studying here, to understand the difference between the way the world works and the way the kingdom works. So, who is the greatest? Well, let's see what the uh, Bible has to say. First of all, in our first lesson, we did this clever little Venn diagram here to show the, the world and the kingdom, and that there's an overlap because we're here physically, and therefore we have an overlap between the kingdom and the world, but this only, of course, works if you're saved. If you're not saved, you don't even have that little kingdom circle. It says, well, we look not at the things which you're seeing, but the things which are not seen, excuse me, while we look not at the things which are seen, but the things that are not seen, but the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So we know that the things of earth are going to pass away, but there is a kingdom that is not going to pass away, and it's eternal. Here it says it's, it's invisible. Just because it's invisible does not mean that it doesn't exist. It means it's invisible to us. I mean, there's many places in the world that are invisible to me. Why? Because I haven't seen them, so they must be invisible. But the kingdom is not only uh, something that's out there, but it's, it's actually in another realm. And to us, it might be invisible, but it's an eternal thing. So a, a better picture of this, it looks more like this. With the kingdom encompasses all the realms and all the universe. And somewhere out there is a little dot that's earth. Because you see, earth is actually in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God encompasses all of this. So this is really a better picture to show the difference between the kingdom and the world. Jesus put it this way in Matthew 11, 11, I tell you the truth. And I love it when he says that. He doesn't say, I'm going to give you my opinion. I'm going to create a new doctrine. Uh, I've got a new point to start a new religion. He says, I tell you truth. 
And so that means that if it's not this, what is it? Is it another belief? Is it another? It's a lie. Because he says, I'm talking truth here. We're not talking religion. This is the truth. Among those born of woman, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So we can start our discussion about who's the greatest by realizing the fact that the Lord is showing us that someone born of woman, the greatest person born of woman, is still less than any citizen of heaven. So even the least citizen of heaven is greater than whoever is born of the world. Now, how do I say it's born of the world? Because it says born of woman. So if we're all born of women, then how do we get to be a citizen of the kingdom then? If you're born in the United States, what are you a citizen of? Okay, so, well then how do you get to be a citizen of the kingdom? I tell you the truth. This is another I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born of the water. And here I'm taking that as born of woman and the spirit. Because the next verse indicates that flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. So how do you become a citizen of the kingdom? The same way that you become a citizen of the United States, right? You're born into it. You're born of the flesh. You're a citizen of the world. You know, the passport in the, uh, of the world, whatever country you're in, has a picture of your physical body, right? But if you're born of the spirit now, you are now a citizen of the kingdom, yeah. a citizen of heaven. So once you're born again, you become greater than anybody down here that's not born again. I don't care what their role is. I don't care if they're the president. I don't care if they're the wealthiest person on the face of the earth. I don't care who they are. According to this, the minute you get born again, your citizenship makes you greater than anyone down here that does not have that. So that's a pretty strong statement. I want you to consider that in the days of Jesus, he had a similar situation to this. We had a kingdom called the Roman Empire. And Israel was actually inside the Roman Empire, right? So it's a similar picture here. We have the Roman Empire and inside there's Israel. Well, Paul understood this principle. See what Paul said. As they stretched him out to flog him, Paul said to the centurion standing there, is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? Now, I want you to think about that here in the world. When the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and reported it. What are you going to do? He asked, the man is a Roman citizen. The commander went to Paul and asked, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, I am, he answered. Then the commander said, I had to pay a big price for my citizenship. But Paul said, I was born a citizen. Those who were about to question him withdrew immediately. The commander himself was alarmed when he realized that he had put Paul, a Roman citizen, in chains. You see the power of being a citizen of the kingdom. If the world understood this, they wouldn't touch a citizen of heaven. Can you imagine? When they figure out that you're a child of the king himself, if the world only knew what they're doing, they don't. But if they did, it would be very different. They figured it out here in the world. But this world hasn't figured out about us yet. But if they did, this is, what it, this is the result. They wouldn't touch us like that. So who is the greatest? Well, first of all, we know that everybody in the kingdom is greater than anyone in the world that's not born again. So we know that already, right? So let's go a little further. To get a little further, let's hear what the original disciples had to say about who's the greatest, okay? Let's start in Matthew. 
And while they were gathering together in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. And they were deeply grieved, at least for another two verses. Because at that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Does that sound like a good answer to, I'm about to be crucified and killed? But yet they're saying, who's the greatest? We say, well, maybe those weren't connected, right? I mean, that, I mean that's, that sounds a little strange for the answer. Well, let's go on. That's Matthew 17. Let's go on to Mark. For he was teaching his disciples and telling them, the Son of Man is to be delivered in the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he's been killed, he will rise three days later. And then he began to question them, uh, what were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had discussed with one another which one of them was the greatest. So now they've talked and they've said, we want to understand this greatness thing, Lord. Well, okay, let's talk about that. But then he comes and shares again with them the situation. And now they're afraid to admit it. But now the minute he shares it, then they're back at it again. Now they're discussing which one of them is the greatest. So what are they really saying here? Why could that, what kind of response is that? Could it be that they're saying, well, if Jesus is going to leave, who's, you know, who's going to be left in charge? Which one of us is going to take his place after he dies? It's a strange thought, but maybe it's only happened these two times, right? Okay, Matthew 20. And who... And we'll deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and scourge and crucify him. And on the third day, he'll be raised up. Then the mothers of the sons of Zebedee came to him with her sons, bowing down and making a request of him. And he said, what do you wish? And she said to him, command that in the kingdom, these two sons of mine may sit one on your right and one on your left. Wow. After just telling him what's going to happen to him, that's what happens next. That's three. Here's four. And they will mock him and spit on him and scourge him and kill him. And three days later, he'll rise again. And James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, came to him saying, now they're coming up. Last time it was, we'll send mom and, you know, oh, we didn't know that. But this time, it's them themselves. Teacher, we want for you to do to us whatever we ask of you. He said to them, well, what do you want me to do? And they said to him, grant that we may sit in your glory, one on your right and one on your left. Same situation. Four times Jesus has talked about what's going to happen. And they said, well, which one of us is the greatest? So that'd be pretty disappointing to me to have your disciples come back with that response. But apparently it's something in the world that's very, very important to people. Four times. Let's follow on with what happened in Mark. So Jesus this time finally answered directly and said, you don't know what you are asking. What do you think? Was Jesus right? Oh, what do you mean? Of course we know, right? Jesus said, can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. And of course they said, oh yeah, we can, right? So being the greatest, you, you, you want to think about this before you answer that quickly, because when you're having this discussion, you don't really know what you're asking for. So he said, sure, we can. And they, they answered, and Jesus said to them, you will then drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with, but to sit on my right hand or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those to whom they have been prepared. So what does that tell you about being great in the kingdom? He answered them. Is it easy? No, it's not. As a matter of fact, he did answer. They asked and he said, sure we can. So they did. So here's 12 disciples, I included Paul here. 
And if you just go down the list there, you'll see killed, killed with a sword, crucified, hanged, burned alive, crucified, beheaded, crucified, beaten to death, crucified, beaten to death, thrown into boiling oil. That was John, but he lived through that one. And beheaded, Paul. See, they wanted to be great. So we need to understand that God can answer that prayer. You want to be great in the kingdom, but you need to understand something. That Jesus was the greatest, right? He obeyed the Father, and he was given a name above all names, right? That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord, below, on, and above the earth. So he was given great authority, but he was obedient even unto death on the cross. So greatness comes with a sacrifice, a lot of sacrifice. To be great in the kingdom, you need to make a great sacrifice. So you want to be great. Well, I, I think it's worth understanding what greatness is like in the kingdom and how you get it. It's not by all the wonderful things you do. It requires a big sacrifice. But remember, Jesus lived the perfect life, right? So if he lived the perfect life and he did it as an example for us to be great in the kingdom, then I would follow his model. And we know how that ended. But it also was that way for the disciples who said, we can drink the cup. Luke, we did Matthew and Mark. Now let's go to Luke. Let these words sink into your ears, but the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and once again, and an argument arose among them about which one of us, which one might them might be the greatest. So that's five times so far in the Gospels. Let's go for six. But behold, the hand of the one betraying me is with me on the table. So this is all the way to the Last Supper now. For indeed, the Son of Man is going to, as it has been determined, but woe to the man to whom he has uh, been, to who he is betrayed. And there arose among, uh, also, a dispute among them as to which one of them was to be regarded as the greatest. Yes, can you believe that? Six times in the gospel, he told them what was going to happen to him, and six times, they started an argument about which one of them was to be the greatest. That, that, that's still amazing to me, but I'm not so sure we're any different. I hope we are. We've got the Holy Spirit, but notice, by the way, that we had Matthew, right? We had Mark and we had Luke, two times each in those three Gospels. So what do you think? Is there any in the fourth Gospel? No. This is it. There's six times. So why do you think there weren't any in the fourth gospel? It was John. And why didn't he include it? Because he was one of the ones doing it. Probably a good idea to leave that out. Jesus continued with his answer. He said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lorded over them. And those who have authority over them are called benefactors, or people that are, um, that are honored greatly. But not so with you, but let him who is the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader as the servant. For who is greater, the one who reclines at the table, or the one who serves? In the world, which is the greatest? Right. In the world, it's the one sitting at the table, right? But, but, it's, but it's not the one who, is it not the one who reclines at the table? He's the greatest because he's being served. But I am among you as the one who serves. So he's saying, look, the world works this way, but I, and is Jesus the greatest? Yes. yes. He said, look, I'm a servant. So he's showing us how to be great in the kingdom. He continues on, and this is also right at the time of the Last Supper. 
The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray Jesus. And Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. So Jesus already was the greatest, right? He had the power to do anything. He was given all authority and power. Let's see what he did with all of that. So he got up from the meal and took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. He did what? Now, does that sound like greatness to you? Yeah, the greatness is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to disrobe before you guys down to my underwear. Does that sound like worldly greatness? And after that, he poured water into the basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. What did he say greatness was all about? He's demonstrating exactly that, isn't he? He's showing greatness. And you say, well, wow, why did he do that? Well, what if the devil had come along and say, tomorrow I'm going to strip you and put you up on the cross and I am going to shame you and humiliate you? What do you think Jesus' answer was to that? Okay. Devil, let me show you something. So he says, I'll humiliate myself. I'll strip myself down. This is my choice. I'm doing this myself as my free will. So what the devil threatened him with to humiliation and all the other things, he said, no problem. I can do this right here myself by my own will. Amazing example. Because they'd ask him which one of us is the greatest, and he's answering how to be great. When he finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. And he says, do you understand what I've done for you? I don't think they did. What do you think? And he asked them, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, this is what I am. So why do you think he said teacher and Lord? See, the position of Lord was the greatest, right? But teacher says, I'm not only the greatest, but I'm showing you. I'm teaching you. So I'm your teacher, and I'm great, so let's talk about how this works. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. See, I've set you as an example that you should do as I have done for you. Here it is again. I tell you the truth. See, when he's talking about the kingdom, he does that a lot. He said, this is the way it really works. No servant is greater than his master. In other words, I am the greatest at this point because I'm the master. And no one is going to be greater than this, and this is what I'm doing. He's saying, this is greatness. And he says, no messenger is greater than the one who sent him. In other words, and I'm no greater than the Father who sent me. So understand that this is the way to be great. Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. To be great in the kingdom, you need to humble yourself and serve other disciples of Jesus. So can you see how this works? See, the kingdom works very different than the world, just the opposite in most cases. So let's look a little further. We talked about the fact that he said, let him who is the greatest among you become as the youngest and the leader as a servant. Well, what does that look like? Well, being the engineer that I am, of course, I've drawn a diagram. And here's my diagram. The way it usually works in the world, if you want to be great, right, what you do is you get a bunch of people to serve you. And you put yourself on top, and now you are the greatest, right? That's how it works. Because the one on top is the greatest. And they're supposed to serve you. That's what makes you great. Isn't that the way the world works? But is that the way Jesus said the kingdom works? No, as a matter of fact, he said just the opposite. The greatest one is the servant. So he said, yeah, we can have the same structure, but just understand it's upside down. Because you are now the servant of all. 
So how does that work in ministry? Well, in a way, it could work the same way. I mean, there's many ministries out there that probably work that way. That they say, I'm the one on top, therefore I'm the greatest. And I'm in charge, and everybody's supposed to serve my vision. I've got the calling. You people are the ones who serve me. I've, got, I've hired a bunch of ministers who will do what I want them to do. And they've got out there, and they've recruited people who will give us money to fulfill the vision that God gave me. So, in a way, it can look just like the one on the left. Or maybe it looks like the one on the right. Where, notice I have three colors here. I have the red, the, the black, and the green. But notice there's multiple reds here. Why would that be? Because the one that's in charge is who? God. God. So the rest is his body working. So really, you'd say, well, does God serve man? Yes, God desires to bless man. And what he's doing is he's saying, I want you to be. He just described what you need to do. So he's basically anointing and blessing ministers and people. Let's just say the red ones are ministers, and let's just say the, 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 the black ones there are the congregation. So now we got a bunch of ministers, and now they're blessing the congregation. And they've got a flow going this direction. So what do you think the congregation's going to do? Which way are they going to serve now? Are they going to serve up? No, because if they're being served, they're going to serve out. And who is that? The world. That's right. They're going to go outward. Can you see the difference in how this works? In this model, the flow goes this way. You serve the one above you. But in this model, it goes this way. So can you see the problem of having a negative spiritual flow versus a positive spiritual flow? Because if you have this flow, then what's going to happen is the people are there to make the donations to serve you so, or serve the ministry so that the ministry can serve you so that you can accomplish your vision that God called you to do. But over here, it's just the opposite. We're receiving from God and we're blessing his people and therefore the, the people are going out and blessing the world. So it's a totally different flow. That's greatness in the kingdom. Now, how's it work in business? Well, notice in business, the little red guy, that's you. Notice he's not on top. You know why? Because in business, everybody works for somebody, right? And I mean, isn't that the way it works? Is there anybody that doesn't work for somebody here in business? I mean, that's the way it works. You work for somebody somehow. If it's a board, it's whatever. So you're never the guy on top in the business world. So imagine over here that we've got the, the little guy on the, the left there in the world. Which way does he serve? Well, he's serving his senior manager. Well, if he's serving his senior manager, then what are the other people under him supposed to be doing? They're supposed to be serving him. And so now we get down to the people who are touching the customers, which are the greens. So what are the customers supposed to do? It's those pesky customers. I mean, they don't understand what they need or what they want. So their job is to give, me, give us money, right? So that we can fulfill what we're doing and uh, get our business plan. So we need you guys to go out and buy stuff. So, that's, so the customers are actually sort of working for the people to give them the money and et cetera. But in the kingdom, does it work in the business world? Can you reverse that flow? Can the top guy serve and can you serve the people below you? And if you serve the people that are supposedly below you, what are they going to do? They're going to start serving the customer. What a concept. So that can work in business too. As a matter of fact, you know what the most profitable fast food restaurant in the country is? Chick-fil-A. Very interesting. Chick-fil-A fast food sales thanks to its service. It's clear leader among fast foods. The national chicken chain that closed on Sunday somehow manages to do better, actually, than a number, than all other fast food restaurants that operate seven days a week. Chick-fil-A is dominating the national sales charts, according to the Business Insider, and its customer service is largely to thank. Gee, could it be that the principles of the kingdom actually work in the world, too? Is that possible? Fascinating, isn't it? They also give away more food than all the others that are combined. That's right. 
How does that work? It's a kingdom principle. It works. It works in the world. Well, let's go to, I know, probably everybody's favorite scripture here. Malachi 3, 8 through 10, right? Everybody loves this one. Will a man rob God, yet ye have robbed me? But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee in tithes and offerings? Now, let me take a little liberty with this verse. And let's look at it in sort of a, a, a kingdom concept here. First of all, you've robbed God, so you've stolen his money because God needs money, right? No? Well, how do you rob God then? If, if, if stealing his money isn't how you rob God, let's talk about it. Does God need your money? No, he doesn't need your money. But he says, you are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herein, says the Lord. So let's look at that. What if there's a storehouse, and there's two views of this. One is a world storehouse, a worldly storehouse. That means that the money that you give goes out and... Maybe that storehouse is that white mansion on the bay that the pastor owns. I don't know. But whatever they look at, that could be one way to look at this thing if you got that kind of flow, right? But how does it work in the kingdom? What if the storehouse was actually there to take care of God's people? Because back then, what did the storehouse take care of? What were they trying to take care of? Widows, orphans, right? They were... Right. They were there to take care of people. So the storehouse was there to take care of God's people. So there's a blessing here because God has a desire to flow blessing. So how do you rob God? God wants to bless his people and take care of his people. If you do not flow that the right direction, that, I believe, is how you rob God. You rob him of the blessing. You rob him of his ability because you don't flow. Now, is that just in money? For all I know, it could be in healing too. What if he wants us to pray for the sick and we're not doing that? What if we think, that, hey, let's go this direction. But what if he says, no, the reason you're robbing me is I want some people healed and set free out there and you guys aren't flowing it. So it can work. When you look at the model, it's an outward flow. And I believe that's what robs God. Because he wants to bless and take care and heal and restore his people. Amen. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the verse 10, but I'm, it is King James and I'm going to read it another way. So I hope you'll bear with me. Bring ye all the tithes in the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house, taking care of my people. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you. Now I've added a little... My, I guess you'd say uh, uh, my own little parentheses and so on. If I will not open you, paren, the windows of heaven, and pour you out, paren, a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Yes, Lord. What if instead of looking up for the windows of heaven to say, Lord, I want to be blessed by your windows of heaven. What if you are the windows of heaven? Yes. What if I, will not, if I will open you the windows of heaven? What if you're the windows of heaven? What if you're the one that people can look in and see the kingdom? And yet you can open that window and blessings flow out. Unless you want to keep it closed so that people can press their nose up against the window and see inside the kingdom as we're over here being blessed. But I don't th we need to be an open window, right? If I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing. What if you're the blessing? What if he wants to pour you out that there shall not be room enough to receive it? See, I believe we are to be the windows of heaven. To be great in the kingdom, you need to be an open window of heaven. And finally, some of these contradictions in scriptures, of course. Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your father who's in heaven. 
let your light shine before men in such a way that they see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. So which is it? Are you supposed to hide your works or are you supposed to show your works? So is there a problem here? Well, let's see what it says. Beware of practicing what? Whose righteousness? Your righteousness. Before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who's in heaven. Now, that compares to glorify your Father who's in heaven. Let your light shine. So, I believe that there's a flow difference here in letting your light shine. So, I think that's what's happening here. I think that your light isn't your righteousness. It's His righteousness. Yeah. Amen. And what he's saying is that it's, there's an issue here. And I believe that that issue is this. How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who have once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars. I will sit enthroned on the Mount of assembly. I will ascend above it. I will make myself like the most high, the great I will, right? Where did he say it? In his heart. Here's a man influenced by that. In the pride of your heart, you say, I am a God. See, it's an issue of the heart. These people can be out there doing these different things and they look righteous. But what if, what if they're, it's an issue of the heart? Maybe they look the same. And one of them is out there receiving great reward in heaven and the other is getting absolutely nothing. Maybe they look the same. 1 Samuel 16, for God sees not as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. In Luke 16, now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, were listening to all of these things and were scoffing at him. And he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves in the sight of men, but God knows your heart. There it is. For that which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. Being great in the kingdom comes from a pure heart that glorifies God. I want to finish with a quote. Now, it turns out I, I often have trouble with, with this kind of thing because there's a lot of people. In just a very, every city, there's a street named for Martin Luther King. And I just wonder how many of them actually know what he said. Well, this is one thing he said. He said, if you want to be important, wonderful. If you want to be recognized, wonderful. If you want to be great, wonderful. But recognize that he who is the greatest among you shall be your servant. That's a new definition of greatness. Was it really new? No, it may be new to the world, but it's certainly not new to the kingdom. And this morning, the thing that I like about it, by giving the definition of greatness, it means that everybody can be great because everybody can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to, to uh, make your subject and your verb agree to serve. You don't have to know about Plato and Aristotle to serve. You don't have to know Einstein's uh, theory of relativity to serve. You don't have to know the the second law of thermodynamics in physics to serve. You only need a heart full of grace, a soul generated by love, and you can be that servant. In the kingdom, we can all be great. It's not just the guy on top. I love what he said here. A beautiful quote. Thank you, Lord. Oh, in the picture, which one is the greatest, you think? Well, Lord, we thank you, Father. We, we thank you that the kingdom works your way. And we, we really do want to understand your kingdom, Lord, because we know that you're going to come back and you're going to be looking for people who can govern in this world, who can be your shoulders, because we know that the government is going to be upon your shoulders, Father, and that's your body. So we ask you, Lord, to just reveal to us the truth about your kingdom, Lord, 
Let us not get caught up in the things that are going on in this world, but let us understand the solution. And the solution is your kingdom and to do it your way, Lord. We know, Father, that your principles even work now down here on this earth. So teach us your ways, Lord. We don't want to just know your hand. We want to know your ways. So I thank you, Father, for just a revelation of your kingdom here tonight. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Amen. Amen.